there is uh, the teaching of uh, the three Dharma seals. The three Dharma seals are uh, impermanence, uh, no self, and nirvana. Uh, they are called the three Dharma seals because uh, because uh, if uh, any teaching that is that does not bear the mark does not bear the marks of the three, these three things cannot be conceived to be an authentic uh, teaching of the Buddha. Impermanence, non-self, and nirvana. And uh, impermanence, non-self, and nirvana should not be uh, looked upon like a description of reality only. It should be uh, looked upon as uh, instruments so that we can work it out. We can, uh, we can uh, train ourselves uh, in uh, looking and in uh, seeing things. First of all, impermanence. Impermanence, uh, it means that um, everything is changing all the time. Nothing can uh, remain itself the same forever. Uh, today, I am uh, a little bit different from yesterday. yesterday. I am no longer the same person because there have been, things have been changing. Things change all the time. And in, and in the teaching of the Buddha, impermanence should be understood in the light of uh, no self because nothing can remain the same thing in uh, two consecutive uh, moments, and then they cannot retain their absolute identity. And that uh, means that uh, not impermanence means no self. When we speak about things like uh, rebirth, reincarnation, we should bear in mind the fact that uh, rebirth within Buddhism, reincarnation within Buddhism has to go along with the teaching of impermanence and self. Otherwise, it would not be truly Buddhist. We have read uh, stories uh, called Rataka, the past life of the Buddha. These are very beautiful stories. Uh, sometimes the Buddha was uh, a deer, sometimes he was a rock, sometimes he, he was a tree. And uh, we tend to think that uh, the same person uh, takes different kind of forms. And uh, instead of uh, uh, while taking a variety of forms, the same person, the same, uh, the same person, the Buddha remains remains uh, intact. It sounds like um, there is a permanent song that enters into one body, and when the body uh, disintegrates, it will enter another body and continue to do like that. Uh, it acquires uh, different kinds of bodies, and that is uh, uh, many people's idea about uh, rebirth. But in the teaching of the Buddha, nothing can remain the same in two consecutive moments. 
That is why to believe in a permanent entity uh, is against the teaching. Oh, yeah. So if we believe in reincarnation uh, and rebirth uh, in that way, we are not talking about rebirth uh, as taught in Buddhism. Impermanence is a wonderful tool. And we should train ourselves in uh, looking at things in such a way that we can uh, touch the nature of, of impermanence. Impermanence is not uh, the cause of our suffering. The cause of our suffering is that uh, things are impermanent, but we believe them to be permanent. <laughs> when we see a flower uh, dying, we do not suffer a lot, because it seems that uh, we are aware, we know that the flower is very impermanent. That is why, that is why we don't suffer so much. But when a person close to us dies, we suffer very much. Uh, Partly because uh, we have not learned to live with that person as an impermanent uh, entity. If we know that uh, we ourselves are impermanent, and that the, the other person is also impermanent, would know how to rich, cherish uh, her presence in the here and the now and would be able to make uh, to do everything to do anything we can do in the present moment to make him or her happy because uh, that way of life is based on the insight of impermanence many people after having lost one uh, one dear uh, relative suffer so much of course, uh, we suffer when we, when we lose someone we love, but we suffer also because of the guilt, of the regret that we have in us, that uh, we have been neglectful. We, uh, we were not very aware that that person can die, that um, uh, we, we consider him or her as a permanent. That is why we did not cherish uh, her presence. And if uh, the inside of impermanence was always there, we would be able to live more deeply our relationship. And we could have done everything we could in order to make uh, him or her happy while she was alive. So the insight of impermanence, the samadhi of impermanence, the concentration of impermanence is what uh, we have to practice. We train ourselves to look at at everything uh, in a way that uh, we can touch uh, the nature of impermanence in them. And that is why I said that uh, it is not impermanence that makes us suffer, but because of ignorance about uh, uh, imp- impermanence that make us suffer. And if uh, we know how to touch uh, impermanence deeply, we discover the nature of no, non-self, of no-self. Because things are changing all the time, nothing can remain the same uh, in two consecutive, uh, consecutive uh, moments. That is why there is no permanent entity, no permanent entity that, that is non-self. And then if you look uh, deeply in the, in the light, under the light of impermanence and non-self, we see that uh, nothing can be by us itself alone. Everything has to interbe with everything else. And that is why uh, sometimes we use the word interbe. Interbeing, what is it? It is impermanent. 
emptiness. There is no self. Sometimes we use the word sunyata, emptiness. What does it mean? Empty, to be empty. To be empty means to be empty of a separate self. A flower cannot be without uh, the cloud, the sunshine, the seed, the earth, the minerals. A flower can only interview with everything else in the cosmos. A flower is full of everything within herself, except one thing, a separated uh, existence. And that is why the word uh, emptiness means the lack, the absence of a separated self. And the worship not like us uh, afraid, because uh, emptiness does not mean uh, non-being. We tend to be afraid of non-being. And uh, if uh, we continue to look uh, deeply into the nature of uh, things and discover impermanence and nonsense, we'll be able later to discover that the true nature of everything is nirvana. Nirvana means uh, the extinction of all notions, including the notion of, of uh, self and non-self, the notion of uh, impermanence and permanence. The notion of being and non-being. Suppose we have uh, a piece of uh, of uh, twenty-five cents, a quarter of a dollar. We observe and we see that uh, the piece of money has two sides: uh, the head and the tail. Suppose uh, one side is impermanence and one side is no self, the two manifestations of reality. But still we have a third uh, side, that is uh, the base from the first two. That is the, the metal, the metal uh, substance. So the three Dharma seals is like that. We might draw a line like this. We put uh, above the line the word impermanence plus non-self. And underneath, under the line, we put Nirvana. Nirvana is the base of everything. Nirvana is the reality of no birth and no death. We have talked about uh, a wave on the ocean. And we have talked about uh, the two dimensions of the way. The first dimension being the, the historical dimension. In the historical dimension, the wave has a beginning and end. It looks like birth and death are really there for the wave. That the wave can be high or low, or more or less beautiful. And the wave can be compared with other waves. There is this and that. The other side, the other dimension is called the outer dimension, namely the water of which uh, the wave is made. From the side of 
water. We cannot talk in terms of uh, birth and death, beginnings and end, high or low, this or that. And yet water is uh, the very substance of uh, the way. We have that yata to practice walking meditation, of which the last line is uh, in the ultimate, I dwell. And when I explained that, I said that if the way is capable of uh, touching the water within her, she will lose all her fear and sorrow, because the water is the ground of being of the way. A wave can leave the light of a wave, but a wave can also leave the light of, of the water. <coughs> so practicing uh, uh, touching the nature of uh, impermanence, practicing touching the nature of no self, we will come to touch the nature of nirvana because impermanence and no self are the two doors by which we can we can uh, penetrate into uh, the ground of our being namely uh, nirvana of all these uh, notions and ideas like uh, beginning, end, um, birth, death, being, non-being, one, all, uh, inside, outside. It means uh, all the pairs of uh, opposites. And these notions and ideas are the ground for a lot of uh, distress and <coughs> suffering and ill-being. And that is why the extinction of these uh, notions uh, bring about the extinction of all suffering. When you try to look deeply into a flower in order to see that the flower is made of uh, non-flower elements, we find out that uh, there are elements like um, the garbage, the compost, that uh, that uh, that are there uh, in the heart of the flower, and we uh, also find out that uh, the garbage is not uh, the opposite is not the enemy of the flower. We also talk about the right and the left. <coughs> we have seen that uh, without the right, there cannot be the left. And this is a way uh, to train ourselves in order to, to liberate us, uh, ourselves of uh, the uh, of the notions that prevent us to see things very clearly. On the first day, I remember we began to talk about uh, body and mind as two aspects of the same thing. 
consciousness, store consciousness, sometimes manifests itself as a body, sometimes as mind. And we should learn how to look at our body as mind. There is a thinking in the blue sky. There is thinking in uh, the mountain. There is thinking in the river. There is thinking in the ocean. The people would like to, to, to talk like that. Because they have begun to see that uh, the blue sky, the ocean, the mountain, is a manifestation of consciousness. And uh, the separation between uh, matter and mind uh, no longer exists. Store consciousness manifests itself in different kinds of forms, in different kinds of uh, formations. We know that there are mental formations manifested from uh, store consciousness, like uh, our fear, our anger, our love, our distress. But uh, store consciousness also manifests itself as uh, other kind of formations, like uh, the eating realms, Mind, uh, store consciousness manifests itself as eyes, as nose, as tongue, as body. Mm? Store consciousness uh, manifests itself as uh, form, sound, smell, touch, and so on. And store consciousness, uh, alaya, manifests itself as a realm of beings. Let us. Uh, uh, speak now about the three natures of reality. Parakampita is the nature of construction. When we are caught by the notion of uh, permanence, self, when we, uh, when we have not seen the nature of interbeing between, uh, between uh, right and left, all and one, our perceptions uh, are full of errors. That is why we cannot uh, reach, we cannot touch uh, the realm of reality in itself. It is like uh, in, in, the, in the dark, in the twilight, when we see uh, uh, when we see a piece of rope, we think of it as uh, we think of it as um, a snake, a wrong perception. So when we are caught by the belief in in permanence and self, we cannot uh, reach the ultimate. The, the realm of things in themselves. And it is like uh, we wear a pair of glass uh, with colors. And uh, we see things uh, through the color. The color is uh, blue and everything becomes blue. That is uh, the nature of construction. It is called Parakampita, the nature of uh, uh, construction. 
we are caught in the notion of uh, inside, outside, before, after, this, that, being and non-being, and that is the way of Barakanapita. We distort reality by our, our way of looking. And this kind of uh, that habit of looking, of seeing things, bring uh, us a lot of suffering. The second nature, we call it the, the nature of Paratantra. Paratantra means we begin to train ourselves in looking at things with the insight of uh, interbeing, interconnectedness. We begin to see that right uh, contains left, left contains right. We begin, we begin to see that the collective the collective uh, is made of the individual and the individual is made of the collective. We begin to see in the light of uh, impermanence and no self and interbeing. And that is the process of training. We begin to to know how to uh, how to see things in their non-dualistic uh, nature, body, mind, uh, self, non-self, and so on. We begin to dissolve the notions, the concepts. And we have a chance now to touch uh, the realm of things in themselves. And then, uh, finally, we come to the third nature, the third nature of uh, reality, which is called nature of Nishpana, Nishpana, the nature of uh, the fulfillment. It is the realm of uh, uh, reality in itself, the realm of suchness, the realm of reality not distorted by our, our mind full of uh, wrong ideas, parakantita. Let us uh, go to the 39, 39 verses. The codependent manifestation has two aspects. The leaded mind and true mind. The leaded mind is imaginary, imaginary construction and true mind is from the fulfilled nature. The deliberate mind here is the mind of Parakanpita. The mind that is uh, conditioned by, by uh, duality, by the notions of uh, self and uh, permanence, The mind is uh, that is a 
that is caught uh, by ignorance, by craving, by anger. And true mind here is uh, the nishpana, the 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 mind that can uh, that can reveal the true nature of uh, reality, uh, namely the nishpana nature of reality. The elliptic mind is the imaginary construction. Imaginary construction is uh, exactly what we have uh, uh, on board. But Kanpita, imaginary construction is Kanpita. True mind is from the fulfilled nature. Fulfilled nature is Nishpana. words are not used here in the translation. But uh, imaginary construction, that is uh, the translation of Parakampita. Uh, we live in that uh, world of construct- construction because our mind sees things like that. We con- construct things like that. If we do not live in the world of suchness, we do not live in the world of the realm of uh, things in themselves. Because our deluded mind uh, invent, create, uh, build, construct a lot of things. And we cannot touch uh, our reality. Let us, uh, let us use a uh, few examples. During uh, a retreat uh, organized uh, at the Omega Institute for Vietnam War Veterans, there was a veteran who told us that uh, until he came to the retreat, He could only see uh, the Vietnamese as an enemy because he has been taught that Vietnamese are enemies. And when he came to the street, he saw a Vietnamese monk. And the first thing, first impression he had this, that this is an enemy. And uh, later on, Thanks to the practice, he discovered that uh, I'm, I'm not his enemy. So if your mind is clouded because of some uh, ideas, some notions, uh, you can see the things uh, in themselves. In the last uh, 31 years, I have uh, been denied a visa to go back to my country. And uh, you can say that uh, I have stayed in Europe since that time. I have never been back in Vietnam.
they have reported that uh, in Vietnam they feel my presence very tangible over there. So the truth is that I am in Vietnam or I am not in Vietnam. Personally, I feel that I am there in a very real way. I continue to uh, serve uh, uh, my friends and my students. Another example. Yesterday, one of you wrote to me and said that uh, um, he can uh, he, he can accept that uh, life and death are happening in every moment of our daily life. We can see that life and death and death into our that happens in every moment of our life. But he would like to know whether it is possible for us to continue. Mm, after our body disintegrate, because I was talking about uh, future life, past life, and present life. He said that uh, mm, the brain, uh, when it when it disintegrate, and then how can we imagine? How can we conceive of a continuation? For myself, even now, even uh, at the time when my body has not uh, disintegrated uh, yet, I can already see uh, myself everywhere. Uh, my continuation, it is there. Uh, if you look uh, deeply in the present moment, you can see my continuation everywhere. Look uh, at my uh, students, my disciples. And each of them carry me within them. And uh, now in this moment, in the city of Moscow, someone is breathing and smiling. That is me. <laughs> And then when you hear the Buddha, when conditions are sufficient, something manifests, and you consider it as uh, existing. And when conditions are not sufficient, something does not manifest, and you consider it as, as not existing. No. That is why uh, Manifestation is the key food. Everything manifests itself uh, from the base of uh, collective uh, consciousness and individual consciousness. And uh, you are still caught in the notions of being and non-being. That is why you cannot touch uh, the ultimate. The brain and the body, when uh, conditions are sufficient, they manifest themselves. And uh, we can see, we can say that uh, they exist. And if one condition is lacking, the manifestation starts, and we qualify it as non-existing. That way of looking is not very deep. It is like a fire. When you fire start to match, you can see fire manifested. And when uh, the fuel runs out, fire is not there, no longer there, you say that fire doesn't exist. You need to take a match to your fire. It will up.
the problem is uh, how to bring about enough conditions for it to move. Now, uh, the air here is filled with uh, signals sent to us by satellite. If you have uh, <coughs> a television post or a radio post, we can help this uh, signal to manifest. Not because it is not because we don't have a television set or a radio set here that we qualify for these signals that now exist. And that is why the meditation, the contemplation on uh, our perception is very important. Because uh, uh, we conceive things according to uh, the patterns of our mind. And we distort, distort everything. We build up a world in which uh, we live, full of illusions. And we suffer because of this. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of our constructive mind. That is why the basic thing is to learn, to learn how to look with the eyes of wisdom, the true mind, the eyes of the Buddha. Let us uh, read another verse, uh, the 40, 40th. Construction impregnate, impregnates the mind with seeds of delusion, thus bringing about the misery of samsara. The full field opens the door of wisdom to the realm of suchness. Construction, it means uh, uh, pita. If we continue to look at things in the way we used to look, Basing on notions of uh, uh, self, <coughs> permanence, uh, basing on our uh, dual, dualistic uh, way, and then uh, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, see, looking, we continue to. Uh, to sow, to water the seeds of delusion in us. And we continue to bring about the misery of samsara, samsara, the will of suffering. And that is why it's the very essential to change the way of looking. Changing the way of looking is the basic purpose. The full field opens the door of wisdom. The full field here is uh, Nishpana. Uh, seeing things uh, in the nature of interbeing. And this is a training. The full field opens the door of wisdom to the realm of suchness. Meditation on the nature of interdependence can transform delusion into illumination. That is the 41st uh, verse. Meditation on the nature of interdependence. It means uh, we practice uh, looking deeply um, uh, according to uh, the nature, in order to, to touch the nature of interbeing of uh, all things. That is uh, Paratantra. Can transform delusion into illumination. Samsara and suchness are not different. They have the same ground. The object uh, of uh, the true mind is suchness. The object of the deluded mind is samsara.
Uh, that is the 40, 41st verse. Meditation on the nature of interdependence can transform delusion into illumination. It means uh, the practice of uh, of uh, of looking, of deep looking, to see the nature of uh, interbeing. That practice can transform delusion and to help uh, illumination to take place. And when the deluded mind is still there, its object of cognition is the realm of samsara. But when the deluded mind is transformed into the true mind, and then the object of the true mind now is such the realm of uh, things in themselves. So samsara and suchness are not two different things, and they have the same ground. It means when the mind is true mind, it is uh, suchness. But the same thing, when the mind is uh, deluded, and then it is samsara. It is uh, uh, like uh, uh, what I said, during the instructions of uh, walking meditation, this ground uh, under our feet, if we know how to walk with solidity and freedom, we become the kingdom of God. And if we walk with uh, sorrow and fear and anger, it is hell, the sin. But it depends on the way our way, our mode of being, that this is uh, some sort of We continue a little bit more, 40 seconds. A flower is already present in the garden. The garbage is already present in the flower. Flower and garbage are not two delusion and enlightenment into us. Where do we have to seek for enlightenment? It is in uh, in delusion by itself. itself. The world of no birth and no death is to be found in the world of birth and death. Store consciousness. In the store consciousness, there are seeds of delusion, of craving. And these seeds of delusion and craving brought about a kind of consciousness called manas. Store consciousness functions permanently day and night. Manas also functions permanently day and night. Yesterday I have said something like this. Here is uh, store consciousness. from store consciousness evolves another kind of consciousness called manas. The delusion about self 
en manas uh, embrace thought consciousness grasp it and conceive it as a self. And never release. Wants to say that uh, within <coughs> us, within store consciousness, there are seeds of delusion. There are seeds of craving and ignorance. And the tendency to look for pleasure to be afraid. All these seeds constitute an impulsive forces that agitate consciousness at the, at the time of name and form manifest themselves. Having alaya as support, manas consciousness arises. Its function is maintaining, grasping that alaya, which it considers to be its object, the self. It comes from alaya. It comes from store consciousness. It arises from uh, alaya, and it turns to grasp, grasp alaya as its object, and its uh, function is mentation. Mentation always, uh, always grasping at alaya and consider it to be, to be the object of self. Manas is the lover. The object of manas is the mark of a self, the appearance of a self, found in the realm of representations. We know that uh, there are three realms of, uh, of objects. The first realm is the realm of things in themselves. So manas cannot reach the realm of, uh, of things in themselves, <coughs> the realm of suchness, because it is made of delusion and craving. And that is why its object is only the realm of representations. It means uh, the constructed world. Related at the point where manas and store consciousness uh, intersect, intersect. So manas is not uh, taking the whole of alaya as its object. It takes only a very tiny uh, part of alaya as uh, object. The 19, as the ground for good and evil of the other six consciousnesses of transformation, manas is both continuous and cogitating. Its nature is both indeterminate, indeterminate and obstructed. Obstructed means uh, it is caught. It is caught. There are obstacles <coughs> on the way. That is why manas cannot uh, touch the realm of suchness, the realm of things in themselves, in itself. But uh, its nature is also indeterminate. It means it can be transformed. Interdeminate, it means it can be either good or evil. Manas is both uh, continuous and cogitating. 
continuous because it functions day and night without stop. That is a kind of consciousness that uh, functions day and night without stop. And cogitating means uh, embracing uh, that part of alaya and consider it to be uh, to be uh, the object of its love. Cogitating, meditation. The other six consciousness of transformation, we can translate it as uh, the other six uh, evolving consciousness, because there are seven evolving consciousnesses. Indeterminate here means it can it can become true mind. It can become the nature of the Buddha. Unobstructed means uh, there is no obstacle uh, standing on the way. There is the possibility of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, reaching the realm of uh, things in themselves. Manas is obstructed. And inter, in, uh, in determinate also. And both of them function uh, non-stop day and night. Store is function is holding together, holding everything together, maintaining all the seeds. And manas always, always uh, grasping. Coming from store, it turns back to the store and grasp it. Born from store, it goes back to store and grasp it and follow stall always. And manas is the first evolving consciousness. Evolving consciousnesses. There are seven evolving consciousnesses. Thought is the base. It is consciousness. And from it, from the base of thought consciousness, there are seven other kind of uh, consciousnesses that evolve from thought consciousness. The Chinese is the seven uh, evolving consciousness. The Sanskrit is uh, Paravritti Vijnana. So, basing on manas, another consciousness is born. Like uh, basing on the eyes, eyes consciousness is born. And that consciousness is called mind consciousness. Or Mano Vishnana. You see, Manas is uh, the base from which manifest uh, mind consciousness. It is like the eyes is the base from which the uh, eyes consciousness is born. So mind consciousness is the is the second is the second evolving consciousness. Manas being the first. And then we have uh, the other five evolving consciousness. It's called eyes consciousness. Ear, 
nose, tongue, and body. The object of eyes is form. The object of ear is sound. Nose is the uh, order. Huh? Smell. Mm, smell. Um, taste and touch. So you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And together with uh, the objects, uh, they make uh, 12 uh, base, 6 objects, 6. And when base and object uh, encounter each other, become consciousness. So you have uh, 18 gram of being. Not only eyes, not only eyes consciousness is manifested from store, but eyes is also manifested from, from store. But uh, form is only manifested from store. Store here means collective store and individual store at the same time. And you should remember there is no such a thing as uh, as um, absolute uh, collect collectivity. There is no such a thing as uh, absolute uh, individuality. It is like uh, um, uh, right and left. We may think of uh, extreme right and extreme left, but it can always uh, extend. And there will be no extreme, extreme right and extreme left. And life, uh, right and left, uh, they give rise to each other. Mind consciousness is not like a manas and store. It operates, but sometimes it stops its operation. Let us uh, read the 23rd. <coughs> With manas as base and phenomena as objects. Phenomena here is the translation of uh, dharmas. ideas, concepts, notions. Mental consciousness manifests itself. Its sphere of cognition is the widest. Everything can be the object of manas. In order to understand it uh, easily, we can say something like uh, with uh, eyes as base and form as object, uh, eyes consciousness manifests itself. 
So here, with manas as base, and phenomena as objects, mental consciousness manifests itself, and its sphere of cognition is the widest. Because it has the capacity to reach uh, to every direction, and everything can be the object of its uh, cognition. The 24th, mental consciousness possesses three modes of cognition, has access to three fields of cognition, and is capable of having three natures. All mental properties are concomitant to it, the universal, the particulars, the wholesome, the unwholesome, and the indeterminate. The three modes of cognition. First of all, it is uh, the direct uh, intuition, direct knowledge without um, having to uh, go to uh, um, inference. And uh, compares comparison. There are three modes. There are three modes of uh, of uh, cognition. The first one is uh, direct exper- experimentation. Uh, The second mode of cognition is uh, uh, is uh, the mode of cognition that is can be called um, mm. discursive. Speculative inference. Suppose uh, when uh, mental consciousness has as its object this uh, white flower. And it can just uh, recognize it as a white flower without uh, without uh, going through a process of uh, of uh, inference. So that is direct, direct. And the second, the second. Uh, the second mode of cognition is uh, something like uh, you see some smoke rising up, and you do not see the fire. But because uh, the fact is uh, the smoke is there, you know the fire must be there. So that is the second uh, mode of cognition. Inference. Inference. And the third. Intuitive. Uh, inference. And the third is wrong. <laughs> the third is a wrong, wrong mode of cognition. If it is uh, correct, it is called the first. It is um, in the case 
that the intuition is not correct, it belongs to the third uh, mode of cognition. In the case, the second mode is uh, not correct, it belongs to the third of, uh, category of, uh, of cognition. In Vietnamese, we use the word uh, uh, hiền lưu. Tí lưu. Phi lưu. Then learn the direct, uh, the direct cognition without going through uh, um, inference. Tí lượng, uh, the kind of cognition you got from uh, inference and phi lượng means uh, the, the case when hiền uh, lượng and tí lượng are wrong. And it is thought that uh, for manas, manas, the first evolving consciousness, its mode of cognition is always wrong. <laughs> we go back to the 24th. Mental consciousness possesses three modes of cognition, has access to three fields of cognition, namely the field of things in themselves, the fields of uh, representations, and the fields of mere image. In our dream, when we dream during the night, uh, the object of, uh, of uh, mental consciousness is the fear of uh, the sphere of uh, mere images. These images, the mere, these mere images, they are there in the uh, in the form of seeds in our small consciousness. And during our dream, these uh, mere image as it manifests themselves and constitute the dream in which we live. But when we are awake, uh, we live mostly in the realm of uh, representations, the realm of uh, construction. And if we know how to practice uh, looking according to uh, the insight of impermanence and non-self and interviewing, we can uh, transfer the realm of representations in order for the realm of things in, in themselves uh, have a shame of the mind. So, Mental consciousness has uh, three modes of cognition, uh, three fields of uh, cognition, and is capable of having three natures. Three natures means uh, root, uh, not root, and neutral. Wholesome, unwholesome, and neutral. All mental properties are concomitant to it, the universals, the particulars, the wholesomes, unwholesome, and the indeterminate. Mental properties here, it means uh, the mental formations. In the name, in the, at the number of 51, 51 mental formations. And all these 51 mental formations uh, can uh, collaborate with uh, mind consciousness. First, there are five uh, mental formations called universals, because uh, all the eight consciousnesses have them have them as uh, as content. 
the five uh, universals. Manaskara um, Attention Turning the mind To the object Feeling, experiencing the feeling. Samsna, perception. To think. Five uh, mental formations are, the, are called uh, universals because all the six, all the eight consciousnesses have to operate with them. First of all, the contact, the contact between uh, objects, object and subject of cognition. Manaskara is uh, paying attention to uh, to that to the object of uh, cognition, and Vedana is the feeling uh, as a result of this kind of uh, contact and attention, and and uh, after that there is a perception of what is there, and Setana is uh, some. Uh, um, uh, is uh, the decision, uh, the volition, uh, the thinking that uh, happens after perception is uh, is done. And uh, when eyes consciousness uh, operates, eyes consciousness has the five universals. When ear consciousness operates, it also has the five uh, universals. And when mind consciousness operates, it has also five uh, universals. Uh, we are not going to mention or to, to name all the mental formations here, but at least we have to, uh, to give uh, the name of the five uh, particulars. Universal, universal, and is uh, particular. Uh, the five uh, particular. First of all, is uh, the desire, the wish. Second, that is uh, a decision, the choice. 
the uh, awareness that you already uh, know what it is. It means uh, the opposite of uh, of doubt. Uh, when you uh, when you see the flower, you are certain, you are confident that this is a, a flower. You are sure that this is a flower and not something else. That is uh, alimoksha. Smurti, remembering. This word is also used for mindfulness, samadhi, concentrating, and prajna, knowing, understanding. So many things. So all mental properties are concomitant to it, the universal, the particulars, the wholesomes, including uh, um, including uh, um, compassion, uh, loving kindness, uh, faith, and so on, the unwholesome, the afflictions, and the indeterminate means that mental formations that can be uh, wholesome or unwholesome. And uh, maybe uh, tomorrow we we'll have a list of these, uh, of these uh, mental properties. They are uh, mental formations in the name of uh, 51. Mental consciousness, this is the 25, 25. Mental consciousness is the root of all our actions of body and speech. Its nature is cogitating but not continuous. It gives rise to actions leading to maturation, playing the role of the gardener who serves the seeds. Mental consciousness is the root of all actions of body and speech. We act and we speak on the base of our thinking, of our cognition. <coughs> its nature is cogitating. It is like uh, manas, the first evolving consciousness. But uh, why manas is uh, uh, continuous, this uh, mental consciousness uh, is not continuous. Sometimes when we sleep without a um, dream, the mental consciousness stops completely. And when we faint, our consciousness uh, uh, may not operate. And uh, when we uh, got into the meditation, the state of uh, uh, no mind, and then uh, mind consciousness, mental consciousness also stops to operate. That is why it is different from, uh, from the first two consciousness. <coughs> mental consciousness is, is not continuous, and the same is true with uh, the five other consciousness, eyes, nose, tongue, mm, and body. It will give rise to actions leading to maturation, playing the role of the gardener who serves the seed. It is uh, based on uh, mental consciousness that we take actions. That actions is to water the seeds within us, to water the positive seeds or the negative seeds within us. If we uh, if we continue to water the negative seeds in, seeds in us, the result will be uh, suffering, more suffering. And if you know how to, uh, to water the positive seeds in us, 
and then there will be more uh, understanding and love and uh, happiness. And if a mind consciousness uh, learn how to look uh, in terms of uh, impermanence and no self and interbeing, it will bring the, the seed of enlightenment uh, to, uh, to grow and to bloom like a flower. That is why uh, it gives rise to actions leading to maturation, the maturation of these seeds. And uh, my mental consciousness is like uh, the gardener. The gardener uh, has to uh, trust the garden. Because it is the garden that can bring about uh, the fruit of uh, understanding and uh, compassion. And the gardener has the role to, uh, to confine the seeds, to recognize the seeds, the positive seeds that are in store consciousness and who has to practice day and night in order to be able to water, uh, to help uh, the seed to grow. But it is the garden store consciousness that can uh, nourish and that can uh, bring about uh, the result, the flower of awakening, the flower of understanding and love uh, is a gift from the garden. And the gardener has to take good care of the garden in order for, for the flower to have a chance to, to grow. Uh, today we have uh, half a busy day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, All of us are encouraged to uh, to be alone, to be on your own, walking, walking alone, sitting alone, waiting <coughs> alone. And this is uh, my suggestion as uh, what uh, we can do this afternoon. Being in the mood of uh, my doing, just uh, uh, practice, uh, enjoying your. Uh, your water, your city, and look, in, look into a few things. If you have a pen to put the note, that would be wonderful. What do you think to be the one condition, the one or two condition that you still need in order to be really happy? What do you think to be the one condition that you still need in order to be happy. Or uh, two, uh, it depends on you. Maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I think we have to look in order to, to call it by its name, Stuna. Second, if that condition will never be realized, if that condition can never be realized, then do you think that you are going to be unhappy for all of your life? Suppose that condition will never materialize. What shall we do about it? How we accept to be, not to be happy for our life. So let us try to answer that question. The third, can you write down on a sheet of paper elements of happiness that are available in the present? In other words, uh, what can make you happy right now, right here? Your daily happiness. Hmm. 
this is a very easy thing to do, but we need to do it. We have to write it down very clearly. The elements of happiness that are already available in the human life. And writing down like that is uh, to uh, recognize them, to identify them. Maybe you think that uh, there are only a few, but if you continue, it may fill up uh, two or three pages. So use a sheet of paper and a pen for your meditation. Oh. What kind of arrangement can you make so that you can you have a chance to recognize them in your daily life and to profit uh, often from them? The idea is that uh, we have the capacity to list our happiness, to list uh, to, to write down elements of our happiness. But uh, the essential is how to arrange so that we have a chance to recognize them in our daily life and to profit from the patterns. What would be your practice? We use our intelligence in order to, uh, to make it uh, possible for us to touch these elements of happiness every day and to be able to, to profit from them. The last point, we might like to do one or two or, or all of us. The last one, for what is not to your liking now? When the situation is not uh, to your liking, what do you think you can do in order to make it more acceptable to you? What do you think you can do to make it more acceptable to you? Uh, suppose uh, our partner doesn't like our practice, uh, is not interested in our practice of mindfulness. Uh, he withdraw from, from us and he uh, continue to smoke and to drink alcohol. So uh, you wish that he will stop uh, smoking, stop drinking and begin to pay attention to your practice and to support you in your practice and to, uh, and to, uh, and to share your practice. Uh, but if uh, the situation is not like that, what do, what do we envisage to do in order to stop the situation? Or we just uh, stay there and complain about the situation? <laughs> so please use uh, this afternoon your free time, your personal time to uh, enjoy uh, looking into this matter. Of course, uh, if we have a, a close brother or sister who know as well, they can uh, offer their insight uh, to us. Uh, but uh, first of all, we have to to use our insight, our own insight. And later on, when there is an opportunity, we ask uh, our friend to, to shine more light, to shed more light on it, and to help us to see more deeply about these things. And uh, after this Dhamma talk, there will be a, a formal meal. A formal meal is uh, an opportunity for us to practice uh, sit
in uh, with solidity and freedom in order to share uh, in one together. In the time of uh, the Buddha, uh, the monks uh, used to uh, to eat uh, in silence uh, with the Buddha, and uh, they stay, they sit. Uh, They sit uh, and enjoy the lunch uh, and do not uh, and did not stand up uh, during the time of eating. They sit in such a way that solidity and freedom be possible. They enjoy the food and uh, the sangha and it allow the energy of the sangha to penetrate in us. So the two aspects, the two um, objects of our mindfulness during the lunch, lunch time is the food and the sangha. And let us not uh, think of other things, just enjoy the food and the sangha surrounding us. The essential is uh, to enjoy our togetherness. That is why uh, after having uh, taken our food, we go into uh, the place, uh, the here, and we uh, sit down with the plate of food in front of us and we begin to put this uh, mindful breathing, like a sitting meditation. And uh, when everyone is there present, they will be in there and we practice uh, listening to the five contemplations. The Buddha uh, invited us to eat in mindfulness, paying attention to the food and the community of practice surrounding us, and not to uh, let ourselves be carried away by meaningless thinking and conversations. Brothers and sisters, when you hear the bell, please uh, uh, practice the five contemplations. And then there will be the sound of the bell, and uh, the five contemplations will be heard. And after that, we uh, begin uh, to, to, to eat our uh, as, as for the 50 verses are concerned, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, as you continue, uh, they become greater and greater. And we will be able to, uh, to come to the, to the, um, 